at Christmas time this Advent season, um, I thought the theme would be then and now. And so I had asked Lisa to put on the stage the then, which is represented over there by the nativity, and the now, which is represented here by the Christmas tree. And so for each of the four Sundays in Advent, um, last week we had hope. They're each represented by a candle. And so Randall spoke to us about hope. And today is peace. Next week, John Cressman is going to talk to us about no. I've written hope twice. Love, John Cressman, and then joy is Christina, the other way around. Anyway, and then it, at Christmas Eve, we have the Christ candle, right, which is the, the one in the middle. And all that is represented in our Advent wreath because we can't get those outer things, right, without that Christ candle in the middle. And so growing up in the Anglican church, we had lots of, of um, traditions and things that represented. But unless we understand why and what they do, they don't really have that meaning. So that's what the, the Advent wreath represents and why we're lighting that. And then on Christmas Eve, you know, we light, uh, we have a candlelit service, right? And that candlelit service comes from the Christ candle, right? The, the lighting of that first candle comes from there. And so just to pull that all together to give you the big picture as to, as to where we're going with this. But today I want to I wanna talk to you about peace. And when we think of peace, you know, different things come to our mind. If we, if we look in the dictionary, you know, it uses this word quietude, which I'd never heard of before. Um, harmony, accord, tranquility. And so I thought, you know, words change and cultures, peace is different. And so this is the time when you can call out to me and tell me, like, what is peace? When you think of peace to you, what is that? What's represented in peace in your mind? Quiet. Quiet. Stillness. 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 Calm. Bed. Your bed. <laughs> With the door locked. Communing with God. The word conjures up um, a lot of images, and, you know, I can search peace, and, and this is one that, that comes up, peace. So there's pictures like this, or there's pictures like this, or like that, peace. You know, these are the things that come up when you type in peace. There's serenity, there's cattle lowing in the background. And so none of that is, is now, right? That was then for peace. And so now some pictures come up of peace at Christmas that look a little bit like a Hallmark movie, right? And sometimes though, if you're not from North America and you don't want to sit by a hot fire, you might find peace like that. Um, the beach, <clears throat> coconuts, serenity. That's where we were last week. But the problem with this kind of peace is that it's a bit like our Facebook feed or our Instagram feed, right? It's, it's fake, just like Hallmark. Sorry, Hallmark movie lovers who, who love, it, love that at Christmas. But I would like to smash your false sense of what peace is. And then I would like to restore it with the right things with what really will bring peace. Because you see, peace isn't circumstantial. Peace is a person, the prince of peace. Jesus, the prince of peace, was born at Christmas, which we have represented here, and he died on what we call Easter. And his spirit, the Holy Spirit, lives within the hearts of those who invite him to. I love these pictures because he's laughing. Right? We laugh when we're at peace. And then, back then in the Old Testament, temples were built to house the presence of God, the Spirit of God, and that's where they went to find peace. They went to the temple. But at Jesus' crucifixion, at Easter, that curtain in the temple was, was torn. It was ripped top to bottom. And then we have this great mystery of where to find peace. And the mystery is that good news to us. And that the Bible tells us that the spirit of peace, the prince of peace, now resides within us. 
So now our peace now does not come externally. It does not come in a bond. It comes through the Prince of Peace living within us. It comes from that guy up there. So no great vacation, no holiday destination, no amount of money in your bank account is going to bring peace. So peace is going to come through something that's not found in this dying world. It's going to come from something that is not temporary. We need peace in something that lasts forever, that isn't going to end. And so thanks be to God, we have it. As Christians, we have that. And in John 14, 27, Jesus said, I am giving you this gift, peace of mind and peace of heart. The peace I give you is a peace the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. I want to read that to you again. Jesus said, I'm giving you, us, this gift, peace of mind. We all need that, right? With the the mental health crisis, the anxiety over the last few years. He's giving us peace of mind, peace of heart. The peace I give you is a peace the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. And in the next two chapters of John, Jesus says that he's the vine. He says, abide in me. He said, they persecuted me, and so they'll persecute you. He says, don't abandon your faith. The Holy Spirit is coming. He says, you won't see me in a little while, but then you'll see me again. And then he wraps it up in John 16, 33, and he says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Jesus brought this speech right before his crucifixion. Why? Because we don't need a chat about peace when things are smooth. We don't need a chat about peace when everything's going well. Medicine is for the sick, and a talk on peace is for the anxious. We think of Christmas these days as peace on earth, goodwill to all men, holiday cheer. We have this idyllic picture of a manger. It looks peaceful. We sing the song, the cattle are lowing. The baby awakes. Little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. It seems so peaceful. But this week, as I was clearing off my mantle to prepare for Christmas and put the nativity scene up there, I removed all the other things that were up there and and, and dusted a little bit and make ready for the Christmas decorations. And I found a sign hanging on my mantle. And this sign says... As a matter of fact, I was born in a barn. I don't know where this sign came from. Maybe one of you gave it to us. Uh, Somebody gave it to us. And I realized that this sign is, you know, a gift from someone who, you know, someone left the door open, right? You know, in this saying, you leave the door open, were you born in a barn? And then I realized, as a matter of fact, Jesus was born in a barn. And it really made me pause. Because we look at these nativity scenes as peaceful with this amazing stream of light coming down and right across the the manger scene. And baby Jesus and the cattle are lowing in love for him. And for those of you who don't know, lowing is this low, mm, 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 when the cattle have a baby. So when we walk into the barn and there's a new calf born, you know by the sound because you can hear this, this cow just licking, making this soothing noise. And so in our idyllic thing, the cattle are making this noise because Jesus is born. It just seems so peaceful, right? And the baby awakes, and Jesus doesn't cry. But where is that in Scripture? It's not in there. We made it up, and it's in a song, and it gives us great peace that this is what happened. So that was back then, and let's think about it. Because here's the facts of Jesus' birth. They had nowhere to stay. Why weren't they staying at a relative's house? They went back to their hometown for the census. After all, someone maybe would have had a room for them, a spot on the floor, but maybe no relative wanted them. Wanted this unwed mother. There was no hospital. There was no sanitary conditions. 
And now I'm a farm girl, but I'm sure I would have died in birth if I had to give birth in a barn. This is not very peaceful. And later on, there's a king who's trying to kill their son. And he kills a whole bunch of babies just to try and find Jesus. This is not peaceful. And yet the angels declared glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. And then this angelic announcement brings with it among um, a lot of stinky shepherds, right? And in they come, a bunch of stinky strangers into your hospital barn room to visit your baby. The manger is a feed trough, the baby's bed. Now we have our unsanitary shepherds. We have no soap. We have no antibiotics. We have ladies, no epidurals which is the peace of birth. No peace from the circumstances. So that was then. Now we think about now, and we have a Christmas tree, and we have our houses so beautifully decorated, and we watch Hallmark movies. But what's the trouble you're facing this Christmas? Probably your family. Probably the fact that they have to get together and all be under the same roof. That we don't all agree. We all have families. And they're all a little bit of hassle. They all have their issues. And we're all selfish. And we all want our pot because it's our holiday. And this is our present. And this is the one that we want. And we want it to go this way. And we want the kids to be just grateful. And everyone just sit still and... We all want what we want because it's our holiday. Whoa, it's so selfish. We have no peace when it's selfish. And so you all know whatever it looks like in your family, but it doesn't look much like a Hallmark movie. So, okay, okay, Libby, we talked about that, but what about that deserted beach? Right, that deserted beach, huh? That looked pretty peaceful. Well, yes, that is where we were last week. Radical Bay on Magnetic Island. And it sounds peaceful, right? Who wants to go there? But I'll add to you a few more details that were unable to be seen in the photo. Because like our Instagram posts and our Facebook posts, they can look beautiful because we don't know all the details. And we can think this person has an amazing life and it's so peaceful. But we'll add to that picture that it was about 38 degrees. It was really humid. And Frank and I were literally covered in sweat because we had hiked for about an hour and a half to get to this radical bay at that point. And they had told us to go on what was called the goat trail. But we decided it was definitely the mountain goat trail, which it was. And Frank was muttering a lot of things about dying and there was no phone service when we got there, and we weren't actually sure where the next trail was, but we knew at the end of the next trail was our bus to get back to the ferry, to get back to the mainland, and when we found the next trail, it contained 941 steps. The water contained stingers, so we couldn't swim in them or go for a quick dip to cool off. There was water everywhere, but there was none to drink, and we were almost out of drinking water. Peace. So peace. Then, now, it will be elusive if we try and find it in the absence of trouble. Peace is not the absence of trouble. Peace is amidst the trouble. And it actually shines brighter in the trouble. So how? The same way a light shines brighter in the darkness. Do you know the saying? No God, no peace. No God. No peace. So if you're a Christian, a Jesus follower, the spirit of the Prince of Peace lives within you. The spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, you are the temple of God. God is no longer housed in a temple like back then. Now he has made his home in the hearts of mankind. The Bible tells us in Acts 6, David found favor with God 
and asked for the privilege of building a permanent temple for the house of Jacob. But it was Solomon who actually built it. However, the Most High does not live in temples built by man. As the prophet, which is from Isaiah 66, says, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Can you build me a temple as good as that? Asked the Lord, could you build me such a resting place? Didn't my hands make both heaven and earth? You stubborn people, you are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Forever must you resist the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is once what comes to live within us. We don't want to resist that. We want him within us. In Ephesians 3, 17, it says, Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. That's our peace. It's within us. The Prince of Peace lives in our heart. So it's not external, and it doesn't matter what our circumstances look like. Then, at the first Christmas, life was in turmoil. It was not an external peace like our nativity scenes make it look like. It was an internal peace that although they had nowhere to stay, the king was trying to kill their baby. They were an unwed teenage pregnancy. Peace reigned. The Prince of Peace, who shines brighter all the more in the storm. Do you remember Jesus sleeping in the boat in the storm? This is the same guy who was born into a storm in a whirlwind. The same guy who lives in our heart, who gives us the peace, who has overcome the world. Now, you might look around the world and think, it doesn't look much like Jesus overcame. There's a lot of trouble. There's a lot of evil. Where is this overcoming? How, what did Jesus overcome? He overcame death. Scripture tells us that he overcame death in 1 Corinthians 15, where it says, Where, O death, is your sting? But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. We can boldly face death. As we went back to Australia, my dad cannot walk. He cannot stand. He can't do anything. He says maybe nine words a day. And one day, as he's rubbing my hand, he said, God is good. Peace. Peace in the turmoil. We can boldly face death with peace because death is not our enemy. Earth does not hold the peace that Jesus came to bring. Jesus came to defeat death so that on the other side of it, we have peace perfect peace. And that is not sitting on a cloud with cherubim singing. No, it's, it's time with God. It's unhindered. Time with God and with those who love him. It's to be in a place absent of evil. Like in the Garden of Eden, they walked, they talked face to face with Jesus. There was no shame they were at peace with themselves, with each other, with their bodies. As John read in Isaiah 9, 7, his government and his peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice for all eternity. That is peace, never-ending peace. So it started back then at Jesus' birth, and it will be forever in heaven. What about the now? The now. The peace in the storm. And we're in a storm. So I hope that no one has ever told you that if you become a Christian, life is going to be smooth sailing. You'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. You'll live to be 100 and die peacefully in your sleep in your own bed. Because remember, Jesus said you're going to have troubles. Why? Why? Because we're not of this world. Because the world hated him. It will probably hate us at times. But that doesn't mean we hate it back. Jesus washed his disciples' feet when he knew they would betray him. That's peace. How did he do that? Because he is the Prince of Peace. 
And the amazing thing is that you and I have the Prince of Peace within us. So wherever we go, we have peace. I know this Prince of Peace from my experience. From the most difficult time in my life when I had to go through radiation for six weeks. And I knew that every time I went through it, it felt like someone hit me in the head with a baseball bat. I didn't want to do it. It hurt. I'd rather peace of no pain. I just don't want to go again, I'd say to Frank. And every time I'd go, I'd put on my phone and put the song, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus, as I would lie down. Peace in the storm. A peace that no one can take away, no matter the circumstance. The beautiful name of Jesus. So a peace that goes with you into your imagined worst-case scenario, which at that stage, mine was getting radiation or a brain tumor killing me permanent, prematurely. Peace. When I was counseling youth during the pandemic, they had a lot of anxiety, as many of us did. And lots of people would say to them, don't worry, it'll get better. It'll end soon. And I went to their house and would say, maybe it won't. What? Maybe that's bad advice. <laughs> but maybe it won't. Rather than saying, close your eyes, imagine yourself on a sandy beach, go to your happy place, I'd remind them of the Prince of Peace living within them. I told them that the power of angel armies, the Prince of Peace, is within me. So now let's imagine a worst-case scenario. Instead of going to that deserted beach, let's go there. Let's imagine now the Prince of Peace with you in that worst-case scenario. So for you, imagine it now. What's your worst-case scenario? We all have it. We all imagine, oh, no, if this thing happens, dread. Oh, no, if my kids this. Oh, no, if my health that. Take a moment and think about it. Is it finding out that you'll have a terminal illness? Is that your worst case scenario? Would it be finding out that we go back into lockdown? Or would it be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you're going to get thrown into a burning fire? Is it like Daniel, and you're going to get thrown into a pit of lions? What is it for you? We all have it, and only you know what your worst case scenario is. And now, remember the scripture. Jesus will never leave you or forsake you. So imagine him with you. That guy. And he's still laughing. In your worst case scenario, he's protecting you from the lions like Daniel. Or he's with you as you're being stoned to death like Stephen. Either way, it's peace. Because it's not external. It's internal. And that's the difference, and that's why we're believers. Light shines brighter in the darkness, and sometimes Jesus allows the darkness to come around so that his light will shine brighter. He allows the storm so people can see what's in your boat. If your life went well every day, where would your testimony be? What encouragement we get when we know that persecuted Christians face death and torture, and they still don't give up their faith. Because why would we give up the only thing that no one can take away? Ephesians 1.14 says, The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised. The Holy Spirit in us is God's guarantee that he will give us what he promised. So today, if you're facing trials, I will pray that God changes your circumstances. But I will also pray that you have peace, even if he doesn't. And that is the greatest prize in the world, peace in the storm. Back then, they had peace in the word of God. They had the prophecies that Jesus was coming, and he did. He was incarnate. He came. Now we have peace in the word of God. He will return. 
We have peace in the trials of life now because of the Holy Spirit in my heart, the Prince of Peace. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that everything's going to go well and you won't get your feathers ruffled. It might not look a little ugly. You may sweat. You may sweat drops of blood and pray like Jesus did. Take this cup from me. But then Jesus also prayed, but not my will, but yours be done. So may today we pray that prayer. Not my will, but yours be done. So if you don't know God or you don't know his peace, I would love to pray with you. You may know God, but feel like, Libby, I don't know his peace like that. I'm still anxious. I would love to pray with you today. I'd love for others to pray with you. I love to come visit, have a cup of tea, and talk about how we foster that spirit within us, how we foster that peace to fan it into flame. It's a work in progress. But the peace will not come from our external circumstances. It comes from him.